Welcome to Detox Radio with renowned speaker and advocate Denise Brown and life coach and author Danielle Pierre. Voices that inspire change. Make sure to tune in every week as Denise and Danielle bring in expert speakers to discuss and educate their listeners on a variety of topics. And now, your hosts, Denise and Danielle. Hi, I'm Denise Brown. And I'm Danielle Pierre. Welcome to the show. Tonight we have two incredible guest speakers. Susan Murphy Milano will be joining us to discuss how to safely leave an abusive and stalking relationship. And we also have Susie Cole with us tonight to discuss bullying and what the difference is between boy bullying and girl bullying. And now I'm going to turn it over to Danielle for In the News. In Topeka, Kansas, the city council are considering and could repeal an ordinance banning domestic violence because some say that the cost of prosecuting these cases is just too high. Facing a 10% budget cut last month, Shawnee County DA's office announced that the county would no longer be prosecuting domestic violence cases. Due to a lack of resources, the Topeka City Council is now considering repealing the part of the city code that bans domestic battery. Sources say 30 domestic violence cases have been turned back since September 8th, and 16 people were released without charges filed after having been arrested for domestic battery. The danger presented here is huge. We urge you to contact the governor's office in Kansas and let your voice be heard. Call 877-579-6757. Again, that is 877-579-6757. Or visit their website at www.kansas.gov for other contact information. Tonight's first guest is Susan Murphy Milano. Susan is often praised as one of the most dynamic and engaging speakers of our day in the domestic violence prevention field. She is an author, activist, and staff member of the Institute of Relational Harm Reduction and Public Pathology Education. Susan is here tonight to talk about her book, Time's Up, a guide on how to leave and survive abusive and stalking relationships. Susan's book is based on doing. She writes from experience, both as a residual victim of interpersonal violence and an advocate for others who suffer. Susan has over 20 years of hard work and commitment to working on solutions to help ensure individual safety from batterers and stalkers. Welcome to the show, Susan. Thank you both for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we get started on asking you about Time's Up, I do want to bring up Topeka, Kansas, that we just did in the news. And uh, we understand that you're doing some things surrounding that. Can you want to explain what's going on? What we've been doing, one of our associates, Claudine Dabrowski, who is out there as a protective mother, lost her children as well. A lot of these women across the country have 16 years she has fought in the system. She's a national advocate. And now in her hometown, Topeka, Kansas, is saying that they're going to remove, repeal the Domestic Violence Act, basically, and not prosecute these cases when they're saying that, that, that it's okay then to beat your wife or be your girlfriend or commit a crime, that they don't want to be bothered. And we all know that those laws across the country were not signed with a pen of ink, but with a pen of blood of everybody that had died. So they are in violation at the state level protocol. Um, we've done radio shows on them. They're on my blogs at murphymilanojournal.blogspot.com. We've covered this extensively. The uh, New York Daily News has covered it. And, and what we're also trying to do is it looks like in our early research and um, gathering of materials, that they perhaps might be in violation of the 14th Amendment, with which Tracy Thurman from 1989 just sued and won on. And, you, and you're talking about the VOCA Act, Violence Against Women Act, that they're, they look like they're in violation of by doing this. And they're saying they're more concerned about your pit bull in the city of Kansas if it bites somebody, but they don't seem to care if you beat and almost or do kill your spouse or girlfriend. So, Denise, I mean, we see wow. this all the time. You know, Denise, you know, this just sends chills down my spine. I'm sure it does for you, too. Oh, it's unbelievable. I, when I heard about that, I thought, what kind of a backlash is this going to spread around the country? And, you know, are other states going to pick this up? And I just thought, oh, my goodness. I, I just can't even believe it. I can't, yeah. I can't even imagine that we are going back up to the years to when it was okay to beat your wife. And to beat the is doing <laughs> So those people that are repealing it, should we all run backgrounds checks and maybe interview their wives and girlfriends? Perhaps they're all batterers themselves 
because I can't imagine <laughs> yeah. that they would put the safety of the city and its citizens in harm unless they themselves were possibly narcissistic psychopaths who do things behind closed doors because, as we all know, that's what people do. Yep, absolutely. You know, it's something that I always say. It's funny that you should even say this. I think we're on the same page here, Susan. If somebody is trying to uh, do something against domestic violence, against bullying, or against any kind of child abuse or anything like that, it's like take a look at their own uh, backyard because, you know, oftentimes there's something there that they don't want to talk about, that they don't want to have out in the forefront. And I truly believe it's like start checking into those people before they make decisions for the whole city of Topeka, Kansas, and possibly their whole state. It's like check into their background. Maybe those aren't the right type of people that you want to have involved in your city. You just made an important point, and I forgot about this, because bullying has become a huge issue across the country. How many offenders are bullies? And how many of these people that are in city government in Topeka are bullies? And I have said this before, that they need to go into the cemetery business and headstone business because that's what they're doing. And so is there some co- contract that we don't know about that they're going to start burying bodies? Because, you know, Renee Paneers who's been missing since January 1st of 2009. Her husband, Sean, is in jail awaiting trial for her disappearance and her murder. That case was never correctly investigated. That case, although that's in another part of Kansas. How many more cases are out there like that? Oh, come on. It's not just in Kansas. That's what the frightening thing is. It's because it happens all over the country. And, you know, as far as these cases, these cold cases that are not being tried or someone, you know, they're, they're being pled down to misdemeanors. And, I mean, my God, we can go on and on about how our government and how our justice system is playing down the, uh, the criminal charges against someone because I truly believe, and I think all of us do, that any kind of a, uh, a domestic assault on anyone is truly that. It's an assault on a human being. It is torturing a human being. And, you know, for anybody to even remotely come out and say, we're not going to prosecute these cases anymore. I mean, do you have a daughter? Do you have a wife? Do you have someone you love that has been a victim of domestic violence? No, no, violence? they're not love. These people, these people who are doing this are love less. These people who are doing yeah. this have missed heart. These people who are doing it, I think we need to call Homeland Security because this is terroristic warfare when an abuser does what he does in intimate partner homicide cases or violence cases that lead to homicide. And so they are committing perhaps something against Homeland Security. They have laws on the book in that city as they do across the country. They can't make these kind of repeals without changing procedurally the statutes. And that city is in violation of the state of laws that were passed by the legislature. So how can they even do this? Because it, it doesn't make any sense. The fact is, too, that across the country, not just in Topeka, but in these other cities, no one wants to prosecute these cases, these misdemeanors. Misdemeanors wind up in cemeteries, and they're not saying that. And and it's a sad day for uh, there should be a march down there. There should be people coming together. There should be some accountability somewhere. But I think that this, you know, so the lights are out for victims of any kind of violence in Topeka. Let's turn them back on. How do we do that? I think that it takes a collective effort. It, it takes, you know, like the Claudine Dombrowski, if people were to email her at angelfury, A-N-G-E-L-F-U-R-Y dot org, and, and start, uh, she's been behind this movement, and start assisting her if you could do research, if you could represent this case, because I think it's a class action suit. Yeah, the Kansas Coalition, as you know, their hands might be tied. That's why Claudine is out there. That's why Claudine because she knows the system intimately, unfortunately, and she knows firsthand. Let's just keep our fingers crossed, and let's uh, let's keep this uh, in the forefront, in the news, so that something like this doesn't happen, so that we can turn it around, and we can turn those lights back on in Topeka, Kansas. Absolutely, and also, um, let's give the number again or contact information to whoever would like to get involved and have their voice heard. Can you give us that? Email address again? They can go uh, two places, either timesupforjustice at gmail.com and leave your contact information, how we can get a hold of you, or angelfury at gmail.com, Claudine Dabrowski, either one of us, and we can get the information to the other because she's really spearheading this whole movement. Okay, yeah, the more voices that are heard, the better. And then I'm gonna, we're going to move into now talking a little bit about you and your book, Time's Up, and I'd like to first 
have you tell us a little bit about your background in domestic violence and, and what brought on the desire to write the book Time's Up and become an advocate for victims? Uh, when victims go for services or call a lawyer or seek police assistance, when people forget, they're coming from a crime scene to do so. They're traumatized. Their environment's toxic. And that's what people who are providing services or taking down information need to realize first and foremost. I, I grew up in an environment where I spent 18 years on a crime scene. My dad was a violent crime detective who happened to have a, a badge and a gun, and he was a serial offender. My mother, I always said, was a veteran victim, so I had two really good teachers. I learned how to be 10 steps ahead of him, and I learned how to keep her alive until she was murdered in 1989 by my father. And I wanted to change how people saw violence. I was an investment banker at the time, a uh, career. I was newly married, newly pregnant when I found them, treated very poorly by Chicago Police Department because they loved my father. He was a great cop. He had caught this country's most horrific serial killers, uh, the, known as the Ripper murders, um, from, like zippers, and drank the blood of their, their victims from an altar. And when oh. five years later my, my father would be known for this, this is where his legacy would be. This is where, and it's kind of funny because just recently on the Chicago Police Department's Wikipedia page is my mother's name and my father's, which I'm pleased by because it shows, and it's the only one up there, but it shows that because he did this with a service revolver, that it shows the, that her life mattered somewhere. Besides the books I write that, her, you know, she's forever enshrined in the Library of Congress, and I'm up. I'm about to have a fourth book, so that's four times she's up there. But for them to have to put this up there and they can't remove it, for her to be acknowledged that she lost her life to this, it's a crime. And people don't understand what happens in these homes. And because I didn't look like someone that the, you know was doing this work as far as what everybody thought that people that did this work, I wanted to learn all I could. I spent a lot of time in the courts. Illinois law dictates, per the Domestic Violence Act at the time, that you were allowed by law an advocate, which I fully, when I, fully, when I started to understand if I did research, paid attention to that and would help people. And I, feel, I realized that when I took time with them, you know, an hour or two hours, they never returned back to the system because they were armed with what they had to do and how they had to do it. And my thing has always been since day one about getting the, the, as much information as I can about the alleged perpetrator because I needed to know what I was up against. And I didn't care so much about her because by getting what I needed about him, I could figure out how to keep her safe and keep her alive. I initially did it thinking it was more about my safety, but it really, unbeknownst to me, became about a tool for law enforcement later on. I think that's an incredible way of looking at it because the majority of the people when you go to shelters or you've got the advocates that go to court, they're usually more concerned about the victim as opposed to actually looking at the perpetrator and seeing how you can keep that victim safe. And what I've noticed also when you, um, when you go to these places that it's all cookie cutter. And you're talking more about individualizing because people are individual. People do have individual needs. Nobody has died on my watch in the most horrific cases that we have read about and seen since my mother's died. I have kept everybody alive, and this is thousands of people. It is taking the time with them. Sometimes it takes five seconds. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. And it's not difficult when you ex – she doesn't know what her rights are. She doesn't know that he – what does a 72-hour stay away mean? She doesn't know that she has rights. If he violates the order of protection, she can go back in. Now with technology, technology is really doing a lot of damage to these women across the country with GPS, with monitoring, with keylogger on computers. So for these women across the country, they have to have, you know, a weapon, and they've been silenced too long. So to, to come out with some things that will help them and educate them so that they can stay alive, in the book Time's Up, that is 20 years of working hands-on with people from across the country and keeping them alive. It is, he has a plan, she must have a plan. What does fear mean to me? It means facilitating ending the abusive relationship, not what you own and put on your table and eat because he makes you do that. And in cold cases, what the Time's Up book does is you need to do this before you say you're going to leave. So in Chapter 4 of the book is what's called an evidentiary abuse affidavit and video. So that means, um, Danielle, if you had hurt me 
or made me not here anymore, I went missing or you killed me. The Sixth Amendment, which is called Crawford versus Washington, says you have the right to face the person who's accused you. Well, I'm not here because you killed me or you made me go missing. So he walks around free. He can do whatever he wants. When these individuals fill out this document before they leave, like a Stacey Peterson, who has not been found, but yet Drew Peterson is awaiting trial for Kathleen Savio in a Bolingbrook prison right now. When, if she had done this, if the police had done their job back in 2004, when Kat, before Kathleen was found in a dry bathtub of questionable circumstances, you wouldn't have perhaps Stacey Peterson, who is still missing since October 29, 2007. They've never been able to find her. It, and they've been arguing in that state, and they also passed what's called the hearsay law. Hearsay is, I say to you, Denise, if something happens to me, not unlike your sister, if something happens to here's the Polaroids, and here's the journal. It's not admissible because you cannot prove she's the maker of those things. So Time's Up provides you with that so that you do the video, you do the paperwork, and it goes to excited utterance and last will and testament and removes Crawford versus Washington so that words from your mother or your sister or, or whomever are heard and they are admissible in a court of law. This case in Illinois with the Peterson case is a circus, and it goes to hearsay. It goes to admissibility. This removes that and right, that's why it's so there's important. nothing solid there's nothing solid for people to grab onto and say this is what was happening whereas the abuse affidavit and whatnot that you are explaining in your book um gives that outlet to where you have the document and much like denise i think you were discussing diary writing correct isn't this somewhat of the same type of no no well, no no you a diary okay. you still have you don't have a, a diary is okay and in the jackie waller case right now she is missing in Cape Dorado, Missouri. She's been missing since June 1st of 2011. Her husband, Clay Waller, is in jail. They were able to secure her laptop out of the car, but there's all kinds of hoops that they have to jump through because she kept a journal on the computer. Will it be admitted? I don't know if Crawford versus Washington and that because, you, again, you can't prove she's the maker of this. What's important to understand about the evidence abuse affidavit, it is like a will. So you're saying... Here he is, this is his name, this is his date of birth, this is his information, this is when we got married. You're perhaps showing a picture of him. You're talking about the relationship. You're giving one or two instances, whether police have ever been there or not. You are then providing, uh, if he's on meds, seeing a doctor, has weapons in the house. You, you have all of that. You also are collecting his toothbrush and bag and tagging it, his hair, or whatever, a razor. In case something happens, these guys are not going to be submitting to a DNA. So you've got it. You've got who this person is, and it's notarized and witnessed. And then afterwards, you have to read it into the video and say, on this such and such day, after you read through this, you want it under eight minutes. And then you say, I sign this, and they initial each page on this last day of such and such, such and such. A diary is not an admissible, it's an argumentative document. Again, why wasn't her, you know, Denise, your sister, why wasn't those Polaroids and that, the, what she kept in that box, why wasn't that admissible? Again, it's hearsay. You have really clever defense attorneys across the country who are there to win the right. case and get their lights, their name now in lights on, on a Google site for whatever, you know, a Garagos or whomever. Uh, that's all that's right. about, whether they win or lose. And, and this removes all of that. So you that's made it important. admissible. That's what you've done. You've figured out a way to make the evidence admissible. Because and, I was going out there, and it was because of Stacy Peterson. So I'm in the church in Naperville within the year after she vanishes, and I'm with the pastor, and I realize that I know where she is in the church, you know, that they're talking, and there's a video camera in the back that they taped for, you know, shut-ins in their sermons. And, and I said, why didn't you tape her? Because I never thought about it. So I was very excited. I don't think anybody knew what I was talking about. I made all kinds of phone calls to people. And I immediately said, oh, guess what, guess what, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm nailed Crawford versus Washington, I'm going to do this. I come back a year later, we, we wind up doing about 100 women, and each one is just escalating, just as dangerous, just as violent, just as lethal, perhaps, as Stacy or anybody else. They are all still alive. Those women who have used it since, um, and this was an idea in my head where I would literally take, it wasn't a book then, I would take forms have a notary there, have two witnesses there, and we videotape it. 
and th- and we made five copies, and there she went, and then she went off. And you saw something different, Denise and and Danielle. What you saw was that when she walked by the pews after she did, she had done this in, at the podium, you could tell there was a light in her. She had come in very ashen and very dark. Somebody knows something for the first time. If something happens to me, so that also gives a psychological encouragement to say, if something happens to me, alive or dead, I've got this. And it'll also help the prosecutor because the prosecutor who has to plead or say the prior acts are not admissible in a murder trial when they've got the body right there, there's no argument. Her voice is is the witness. Her voice is the testimony that they would not get otherwise. Just like if you if the three of us prepared a will, it's admissible in court. I'm just going the extra mile because I'm allergic to divorce attorneys. Although some I have very <laughs> good friends that are, but I'm allergic to them. So I know how they think. And this is just yeah, an added just, way. Yeah, Susan, you know, there was a, I was uh, gosh, in one of the states, and uh, I was talking to uh, a judge, and I asked him about the diary. And uh, they said, he said, please, tell your victims to keep diaries. Now I'm hearing something completely different on your end, which is really interesting because here I have a judge saying, take the diaries, they're admissible in the court. But you're right. They will, the defense attorneys will fight that. They will say. And it depends what what state you're in, Denise. Each state has different requirements, different laws. You're not going to be able to go, and he's obviously, he wasn't the judge, obviously, that this is what he was, you know, understood. Yes, but I truly believe that your way, um, your affidavit, your abuse affidavit, is something that we need to get out to the masses. We need to get out to every woman because I get phone calls at the Nicole Brown Foundation, and when I get those calls, I want them to have your knowledge and all of the information that you have so that we can continue saving lives and we don't uh, we don't hear these horrific stories like a Nicole Brown, uh, like a Stacey Peterson, like all the women that lose their lives on a daily basis. Wait, wait, wait. Denise, Absolutely. you know, we've lost more women than we've lost in all the wars combined. The total yes. numbers yes. that we have, and, and you don't, they're not even correct numbers sometimes, but I think last year it was 16,800 that they counted. They counted. Oh, now, you, yeah. there's, there's, we don't get them categorized correctly. And, and if we go back to Topeka, Kansas, what box are they checking? Are they checking a dog lease box? You got, are, yeah. are they, are, you mean, what are they doing? And, and so every state operates differently. This is a uniform way. And what we have to do is get this as an accepted practice across the country. This book and the tools in it were sent across the country to scholars. Georgetown University is interested in doing something. Coastal Carolina, universities that are now stepping up to do some things that are going to change intimate partner violence. And I say intimate partner because when we say domestic, and this goes across James John Morrison, his his abuser was a prominent physician. He did not just go off. That's an intimate partner missing person homicide case. That when we say intimate partner, we don't think of somebody with a broom in their hand sweeping. That I think that if we change also that this is an intimate partner. If we also look at the missing persons cases and, and call them IPV related, if we attach that, again, domestic sounds like a bad sneeze. And we need to catch up with the times and we need to do things for the offenders so that we are ahead of their game. And isn't that what we need to do? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, this your book, honestly, um, it should be handed out <laughs> with every domestic violence Cool. Well, they should get it. They should, every order of protection they should have to do. They they can do it at the library, right. and and it's not something you do overnight. This is years of abuse. So sometimes it might take you a little bit. You have to get your ducks in a row. The a lot of the women don't have money for legal services, and then you've got the imbalance of the court system. You have the where they go for the divorce. Where if mainstream media, which is what I'm grateful for in this to be Kansas issue. Mainstream media start picking up the fact that in these court systems, when they are abusers, get their children and they kill. We're seeing at a record rate children being murdered in the homes by these abusers. When she says, I'm leaving or I'm ending the divorce. A couple of weeks ago, a five-year-old girl watched in Sunrise, Florida, her mother being shot at this ranch, her grandmother, and then her stepfather killed herself. And you could hear on the 911 call, when she goes down to the neighbors and the 911 operator is there and she said, I have no more home. Please, what am I going to do? Help me. Can I come here and live? Oh, Five oh, years old. And you're going to punish her because she has no place to go 
and you're going to punish her and put her in the system because there's no relatives to take care of her. And that's and and you're seeing that in more and more cases. There's another one similar where three kids, and they said we're going to wind up putting the kids in foster care. You can't do that. They're going to look at that as a punishment. These and those kids were three, six, and eight or something. That's what you do. You know, honestly, the the community just really needs to step up on this. I and you've been saying this anymore, forever or and for all years. On their and screen. exactly. And yeah, you're right. You are absolutely right. But this, I mean, the more awareness of this, the more that's out there, the more. No, that we I, keep I think the we're done with awareness. Talking. I think we're, we got to get your ass in gear and do. I think that's that. You know, I'm still the little girl who. Couldn't well, no, say you're right. Mom. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely. And right. I'm not saying it to but be I, defensive I mean by, or defiant. You no. Know, what I mean by awareness. In, in the way that I was looking at this, is to keep this out there. Keep it up. Keep talking. Don't stop. Do you understand? And then start working together on doing something, speaking up, stopping it. I mean, you would have thought, I, you, but you would have thought after, after Denise, after your sister died, you, you would have thought the absolutely. world paid attention and yeah. did what they were supposed to do. And what do they do? Yeah, you're right. They don't. And I say that. And how the dare time. they? I always, I always say that. It's like, why does it take, it takes one person to be murdered, where all of a sudden it doesn't just happen to the poor and the homeless, it can happen to anybody. Uh, a very affluent uh, young lady gets murdered, and, you know, people that never in a million years thought that it could happen to somebody of that nature. So, well, look at what sudden, you've done for this country, for these women's lives, and, and damn everybody for not embracing you, for what you've done. That's what's wrong. This is murder. This is a planned out, yeah. calculated murder, and they need to... Step up to the plate. Well, and instead of every time, like a Rihanna and Chris, uh, and then the, it's back into the public eye, and then all of a sudden it's forgotten about again. Well, there's a lot of those people that this is happening to, and we have to do. Like you said, Susan, we have to do. It's time to do so that we can continue saving lives instead of sweeping it under the carpet and saying, oh, you know, maybe, maybe not. It's time. It's enough already. Or waiting time for something out. else to become public. Yep, time absolutely. And where can we get a copy of that book? Where can the listeners uh, go to Amazon.com? You can go on my website, um, SusanMurphyMilano.com. You can go to your bookstore. Uh, everybody seems to have an easy way to want to download it. Also, we have them available in ebooks. You can get them on Kindle, Smashwords, so they're available all over the place. Well, we'll put we'll put it on our website as well. Listen, Susan, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on here. And gosh, so much information, so much amazing work that you do. Keep it well, up. you as well. And, God hey, bless you for what you do every day. Thank you. Right there with you, and we're going to continue this fight, and we are going to do. Thank you, Susan. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Stay tuned in, and we will be right back with our next guest, Susie Kroll. Bullying, violence, and suicide among teenagers and college students has increased tremendously over the past few years. We need to educate our families, students, school staff, and the community on how to detect a problem and prevent a tragedy. The Elite Speakers Bureau, Inc. was formed to educate the public and bring awareness to many issues, including bullying, abuse, violent crimes, stalking, and mental health, just to name a few. Our speakers are professionals with vast knowledge on these topics. The Elite Speakers Bureau team includes renowned authors, advocates, therapists, celebrities, and more. If you would like to book one of our acclaimed speakers for your next event, or for more information, visit www.TheEliteSpeakersBureau.com or call 949-544-1410. That number again is 949-544-1410. Welcome back. Teen dating, bullying, are on the forefront of the news since Jamie Rodemeyer, 14, committed suicide outside his home after being bullied in upstate New York. He regularly posted about being bullied at school and how people would launch gay insults at him. Jamie is stupid, gay, fat, and ugly. He must die, read one post. Another read, I, would, I wouldn't care if he died. No one would. So just do it with a little happy face. It would make everyone way more happier. On September 9th, Jamie wrote on his Tumblr site, I always say how bullied I am, but no one listens. What do I have to do so people will listen to me? Our guest, Susie Kroll, an expert in teen relationships and bullying, is going to help us answer this question. 
Hi, Susie. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hey, can you help us answer this question? Why is it that this poor boy and so many like Jamie have to lose their lives? That is a very tough question, and it is very, 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 very much on the forefront of my mind to get answered. First and foremost, I don't know where or how adolescents seem to learn a skill, but they learn the skill of isolation and bullying, and somehow either violence or teen dating violence abusers and bulliers are very adept at making their victims feel useless and powerless and alone, and then we end up with a situation like Jamie's where no matter how many times they attempt to reach out in any way they know how, they don't get heard until they're gone. And it's a disgustingly sad lesson that it appears most very smart, intelligent adults can't answer at this point either. We just really, really need to educate and make teens and kids and parents aware that their actions have serious consequences and that death or the impending threat of death is huge and that we need to listen before it's too late. Well, see, and that's what, that's what I truly believe is that it takes proactiveness as opposed to reacting to situations. People need to be more proactive when it comes to situations like this so people like Jamie and so many others don't end up losing their lives. Absolutely. I do think it's hard for people to hear such a young person say they want to kill themselves or that they're alone, so they automatically jump to getting away from that discomfort and thinking, oh, they're not serious, it's a phase, they're kids, they'll get over it, it's just elementary school or junior high or high school, and they try to maybe brush that under the rug because the thought of that actually happening is really, really scary and disheartening, and I don't think really a lot of adults, let alone teenagers, know how to deal with that. What are um, some of the warning signs that parents can look for to identify maybe that their child's being bullied? Because there, I hear a lot that the parents weren't aware that their child was being bullied or, you know, the awareness doesn't seem to be there. Uh, it is in some cases but and not in a lot of cases. So what is some of the signs to look for in your child, either as being bullied or maybe even being a bullier? Well, if you, have, if you have concerns that your child is possibly a victim of bullying, things you can look for are a decrease in, in performance at school. Maybe their grades are falling. You can see either massive weight loss or, on the flip side of that, weight gain and a change in your child's overall behavior. They don't hang out with the people that they used to hang out with. They spend a lot of time alone, sequestered in their rooms, and I know that that probably is a bit of a teenager attitude also, but the best thing you can do if you see the weight loss or the withdrawn or the lack of interest in things that used to make them happy, change in dress, attitude, are to sit down and ask your child. And if you're really, really, really and truly concerned, you ask them again and again and again because if you're looking back at it and your child has committed suicide, wouldn't you rather have pissed them off and gotten nosy and angered them and had them talk to you versus now you're being heartbroken and sad and they're gone? So as a parent, you, yes, have to respect your child's privacy or as a concerned friend, but pushing to get that information and make sure they're okay and having that child realize that they can come to you regardless of what the information is is huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you ever do you ever find that uh, some of the uh, some of these young kids they uh, tell their parents that yes everything is okay but deep down inside uh, you know like Jamie and so many others they're being bullied on the internet they're being bullied at school they're being bullied outside of their home environment and the parent takes their word for oh you know mom everything's okay and they've got a smile on their face and then deep inside I mean they're holding this all in. So, guys, what do you what do you tell a parent when you say, you know, your parent or your child tells you that, you know, I'm okay, everything is all right, but yet you find out after the fact that all of this stuff was going on behind closed doors. What do you what Absolutely. do you do for somebody like that? What do you say? In in that instance, one, I would be very, very heartbroken if they, in fact, did lose a child. But then I would also say I know that a lot of parents are torn between wanting to be a parent and their child's friend because children, teenagers, are very good at shutting people out. I would start from an early age, and I would say, you know, you need to know that you can come talk to me about anything. And now that you're interested in having a Facebook account or a Twitter account or any other social networking account, the requirement for you to have that 
is to let me have access to it or to periodically show me what you're doing. And also, now that you're going to be out in the social networking area and in the arena of the Internet, we need to talk about some of the things that happen with bullying, with, with harassment. We need to talk about privacy settings and what it means when you post something out there. It's not just to your friends. It can be anywhere on the Internet. So you need to really be aware of your child's social media habits. You need to be able to have access and learn the technology so that you can get in there and look at what they're doing and what they're saying. You kind of have to be an Internet detective and not be afraid to get in there and look because that is going to be your truest indicator of whether or not your child is actually telling you the truth about being okay or not being okay. And I have seen in the past that one of the reasons why a teenager will be very good at acting and telling you that they're fine is because from a very young age, the stigma of a tattletale and the, the ruthless relash or backlash from being a tattletale is horrendous. It's almost worse than being right. bully being labeled a rat. So a right. child learns from a very early age that if they're having a problem, they've got to solve it themselves. Because if they bring in the teachers, the principals, their parents, then not only are they whatever these people are calling them as a moniker or a tease, but then they're also a rat or a tattler, and then the bullying becomes worse. You know, and that kind of brings me to my next question, which was going to be now, you, let's, if you're a parent, let's say, and you found out that your child's being bullied, then what? What's next? You know what I mean? What, what do they do next to protect them from further bullying? And can you give us some insight on that? Well, the considerations that I would make would be, one, to have that child change all of their social networking accounts. And I don't mean just change passwords. I mean change them all together. Close the ones that they've got. If they want to start new ones, then we sit down and we talk about who we let have access to them and what they do. If the bullying is so severe, maybe we put a barricade or a block on all social networking until the, the problem is resolved. The next step would be is sitting down with your child and really getting down to it. What exactly is happening? How long has it been happening? Who is it happening to? And who is doing it to you? That way you have a very, very clear picture of all the parties involved and all the information and things that have been involved. And it's a good idea before you close those social networking to print out or to save evidence about the conversations that have been happening. And then it probably is a good idea to instruct your child and say, look, a bully is specifically trying to target you, make you feel alone, and make you feel worthless. The best thing you can do is show them that it's not getting to you, and I know that you've been trying to do that, but we're going to take it a little further. You're going to hold your head up high, and we're going to talk to, if it's necessary, if there's life threats, the police, a principal, a school guidance counselor, the teachers that are involved, and take it to the next level. And, yes, it will feel huge and like it's going to blow up, but it will eventually have to put an end to it. And usually mm -hmm. things escalate a little bit life. before they get better. Uh, Susie, I I'd like to know, is there a difference between boys bullying and girls bullying? Oh, my goodness, absolutely. There is a huge difference. Boys bullying is usually a shove in the hallway or a name call or picking on their, their target in a gym out in the open with a group of guys. And it, it tends to be a little more physical. I'm not saying necessarily huge brawls and fights in the schoolyard, but a shove or a push or a trip or a knock the books out of their hands, that kind of taunting. Girls taunting, I don't know where the skill comes from, is insidious. It tends to be more on, online. It tends to be more exclusionary. You're not our friend anymore. You're not part of our group, and we are going to target you and ostracize you, and be, you'll be the target of our fat jokes, our you-can't-dress jokes, our you-can't-get-a-boy or a girl or a partner jokes. You're going to be the one of this group of people that we pick on. And then I found that when you talk to the kids that are doing the picking, in the back of their minds, they're relieved it's not them, and they would rather follow the crowd and be safe and hidden in that, that group of people than possibly be the one that gets targeted. So they go along with it to keep themselves safe, not necessarily because they want to be the bully. They just don't want to be the victim. Oh, interesting. So girls really are more mentally and verbally, and the guys yeah. are, it sounds a little bit more physical, doing more physical activity than the girls do. And I kind of wonder, which is part of the reason why I'm doing a master's program and studying this, but I wonder why it is that a girl or a group of girls is much more adept at taking insecurities and really picking on them. And usually they're the same insecurities that the bully themselves have. 
and they will translate that to ostracizing one specific person and making their life absolutely miserable, whereas a guy isn't necessarily making comments about another dude's appearance or how how he's a weakling or he's fat or he's, you know, that kind of thing. It's It's some other type of taunting, but with a girl, it is so insidious, and I think it's so much more powerful to have a group of girls that usually were your friends come back and talk right. to you and know your secrets and your impurities. Okay, so uh, so it is. It's just chipping away at that self-esteem that you have, and you eventually feel like you are nobody and you're no good. And then uh, that goes to get to the point that it gets so bad that, you know, you'd rather end your life than to work around it or to try to figure out some way to stop this from happening because you are just so beat down. Yes, absolutely. And these but, are also signs that... So girls, uh, they do, they they have a lot of, um, they trip away at someone's self-esteem. I mean, they just put you down and put you down and put you down until you actually feel, like the victim actually feels like they're they're no good, they're nobody, and they're, it's better, they're better off ending their own lives. So that, that men, mental breakdown is what needs to stop. And that's something I truly believe. I mean, it goes on in school. So I think that the school needs to be up to date on all of this bullying. Absolutely. I do I do think that there should be some sort of training course or education course along with the student orientation. Here's a, here's a segment on bullying. This is what it looks like. And it doesn't need to start in high school. It needs to start early. We need to catch it before it happens instead of after it happens, just like you were saying about being proactive instead of reactive. I remember when I was in school, I got sex education in fourth grade. I wasn't in any way, shape, or form even understanding what that meant, but I knew what it was, so that when I got to that point, I wasn't completely inept in making mistakes. It's the same thing with bullying. If you teach an elementary school student what it looks like and what it's going to feel like, they can better recognize it and stop it before it gets to the point where they're on Tumblr, they're on Twitter saying, I want to die. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree with that. I think that anytime you're proactive, you can stop things from happening. I think our society is very reactive, and I think we need to become more proactive in these things, I think, as adults and as you know, the politician, the legislators, and people in our society. I truly believe that they need to become more proactive in this. I'm really happy to hear that, you know, Lady Gaga wants a meeting with President Obama because she's just horrified about what's going on. I think some of these celebrities that are jumping on board, I think it's absolutely amazing. Why does it have to take someone's life for all of these people to jump on board? Let's figure out ways to stop these horrific things before it gets to such extremes, and let's figure it out and stop it before it even starts. Absolutely, and I it saddens me that it takes, one, somebody dying and losing their life and having this huge media attention brought to it. And two, it, it makes me sad that it takes a celebrity and somebody that's at the center of the media, the music field, acting, whatever, to, to get a parent to listen. A parent or a guardian or a teacher or another adult should want to listen for the sake of the child. And apparently the only way to reach that parent and those groups of people and legislation is to have somebody huge and famous get their attention. Because lowly single parent or lowly loan principal just isn't enough to have the clout to get somebody to pay attention. And it's even sadder that just recently a song came out by the Perry Band, and one of the lines in it says, it's funny how you're, when you're dead, people start listening. And the title of that mm-hmm. song is If I Die Young. And I had heard huh. that just after wow. Jamie had killed himself. And it huh. made me cry in my car. And it made me disgusted that it had to get to that point. Yeah, I agree. I agree. When a child's being bullied, or what would you say to a child who is being bullied, where they can turn to for help? How they, because, like you said, the, the children label tattletale. So that, that's a big factor here. I, I, that, I really caught that when you said that, that children are afraid of being called a tattletale or a snitch or whatever it is that the term is, depending on the age. But because of that, I think they keep a lot of this inside and they don't tell anybody. So if you are a child who's being bullied, where do you turn? What do you do? Do you understand well, without, of, without that fear of being further bullied? I didn't, I'm sorry. Without that fear of being further bullied because you told. Right. right. Well, the first thing that I would say to any child that I was trying to educate about bullying is that it is a tactic of isolation and a tactic of slowly d- destroying your self-esteem. And... To counteract that, 
yourself and in your heart, first you need to remind yourself that it isn't true. And that's not easy. And you need to keep reminding yourself that it isn't true and that you are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are powerful, and you are worth your life. And then the next thing that I would say is if you don't want to take it to the next level with the principals and the teachers or the police, approach your parents and ask. Say you need to see a counselor or a therapist and get that support to help you cope and and resist the bullying and not believe the garbage that's being said to you. And if your parents don't listen, you ask a doctor or a pediatrician or a school counselor that will listen to you and keep it confidential until you get to that point where you have somebody that is providing the support system you need. And there are dozens of hotlines across the nation that also have the ability to have you phone in 24 hours a day and say that, you know, this crap is going on and I don't know how to deal with it and get their ideas and their resources direct for your area. And then you have a way to have a group of people outside of maybe making a formal complaint inside of keeping you strong and and helping you have coping mechanisms to deal with the bullying. That's excellent that there's a number. Um, I didn't realize, actually, until you just said that, that there's a number that a teenager or a child can call. They're being bullied, a hotline. That's huge. And actually, we should get that number from you and post it on our website. Susie, is there anything else that you want to say? Yeah, actually, I have one one really uh, powerful last thought. And it is that in cases of teen dating violence, bullying, and even domestic violence, everybody needs to remember that the bully, the abuser, the taunter is trying to isolate you, is trying to make you feel worthless, alone, and not worth the space you take up on the planet. And if you recognize that that's what they're trying to do, you can stop it before it happens or before it gets crazy to the point where you're reaching out into cyberspace for strangers' help. That bully is just trying to make you feel alone, and the best thing you can do is not be alone to somebody. Your real friends, your true friends, your parents, your teachers, church, whatever is your strong support system, and you tell them what's going on because that bully has power when you're alone, and they are powerless when you are not. Absolutely. And, you know, you've touched on a good point. And most bullies, I would not say if not all bullies, are suffering from their own self-esteem issues, which is why they bully other people. And if, if a child could get a grasp of the person that's bullying them is actually the one who is not feeling good about themselves and it's not about them. And that's a hard thing to teach a child to understand. Mm-hmm. But like you said, if we catch them early and make them understand that it isn't about them and that this yeah. is an issue that's going on with that person then it might be a little bit easier for them to handle what's going on and to seek out help. Absolutely. And for any bullies that are listening, if you think that you're a bully and you're hurting someone else, I would uh, ask you to look at your life and see who's bullying you. And it may not be somebody at school. It may be an older sibling, an aunt or an uncle or a family member or somebody outside school. You can still be a victim of bullying that way and you can reach out and get help yourself instead of, creating the chain and doing it to someone else. Absolutely, absolutely. If we can help the bulliers as well, because they're suffering in some way in order to become a bullier, I would think yes. that there's something going on with them as well. So, I mean, if you, if we, as parents and as um, educators and, and a society, if we just pay attention and are aware of the signs and aware of what's going on and we see it when it starts to happen, you know, and we're attacking it from both sides, from the side of the victim as well as the bullier or addressing it, I shouldn't say attacking is a bad word. I think that, that that's a start. That's somewhere to begin with these children who are taking their lives and who are going through depression and, and it's just, you know, an awful thing. So And as adults too, coming from any generation where the bullying was a phase and it was just at school and once you graduated everybody grew up and got their head on straight, we all need to realize that times are different now. There is this huge monster called the Internet that has all its blessings and all its curses. There is a new way to attack people and haunt them every place they go, and it is open to anybody willing to look. And that bullying and the the beast that it is is so incredibly different than it was in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even the 70s. And that if we recognize that it's not the same and it's different and it's deadlier, then we will make the steps necessary to tame that bullying beast so that it becomes not a life-taking, serious threat to the lives of our children. Susie, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. 
Thanks, Susie. <laughs> I had a great time. Thank you. If you'd like to have Susie Kroll come speak at your school or event, just go to our website at www.detoxradio.com and click on Susie Kroll. If you're in the market for a voiceover for your next e-learning project, commercial, audiobook narration, corporate video, or phone system, we are here to assist you. Visit us at www.ineedavoiceover.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you'll join us again next week. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Detox Radio Show or friend us on Facebook. Good night, everyone. Good night. If you would like information about upcoming shows or are interested in booking a speaker, visit www.detoxradio.com. Thank you for listening to Detox Radio with Denise and Danielle. Be sure to tune in next week for another great show.